Thanks for staying up later. The tennis great Arthur Ashe is with us tonight, and it certainly doesn't seem like 22 years ago, but the calendar tells us that it is, that you won the U.S. Open in 1968. Was that or Wimbledon in 75 your biggest victory? It was at the time, although emotionally I had a larger victory when I was 18 in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the University of Virginia when I won the USTA National Interscholastics, the National High School Championships. And uh, my tennis coach always wanted one of his pupils to win that tournament. And when I did uh, nine years after he had started entering his pupils in it, it was a very satisfying win for me. But yes, the US Open in 68 was very big and it, and it was a crazy year. You win the US Open. It's interesting, that was at a time when there was a legitimate amateur professional right, distinction. Right. So the first prize money goes to Tom Ocker, the guy you <laughs> defeated <laughs> in the right. final. That's right. And then you're asked to go on Face the Nation. And what do they want to talk to you about? Obviously, they didn't want you on the same way they'd want Tom Ocker no, on if he had won. No, no. Uh, I thought it was uh, interesting that I was the first athlete asked to be on the show, uh, which I did from Los Angeles during a tournament right after the U U.S. Open, that first Open. And we talked about politics, uh, race relations, uh, the role of people like myself who were postured as opinion leaders, people who can influence others to act or do uh, certain things certain ways. There is no real prejudice on, uh, on the Davis Cup team. When I say real, nothing that really applies to me personally, other than just institutionalized uh, segregation or prejudice against all black people in general in the U.S. Uh, but we get, there are only, um, there are seven team members, one captain, one trainer. We get along famously. And I, uh, I go out with them socially all the time, and my best friend's white. And uh, <laughs> sounds funny to turn around. Some of your best friends right. are white. Right. My, my best friend is one of my Davis Cup teammates. And uh, they don't care who I date or who I go out with or where I go. And we do things together, and there's no, no apparent uh, prejudice in our team at all. As I say, tennis is different. How about the black American public? Do you find that any of them regard you in a sense as an Uncle Tom? Because yes, he takes yes, this position? quite a few. Um, and uh, possibly justifiably so in some instances, and possibly not justified in some instances. 1968, obviously you're the only prominent black player on the circuit, and black athletes are making statements. Muhammad Ali at that point is in exile because he wouldn't go to Vietnam. Shortly after the 68 U.S. Open, uh, Smith and Carlos, so right around that same time, would, right. would have the clenched fist salute at the Olympics October. in Mexico City. Uh, did you feel as if you were doing enough? Um, no. And the standard was not Tommy Smith or John Carlos or a combination. The standard was Ali, because Ali in 67 at the Houston Induction Center refused to cross the line, symbolic of entering the United States Army voluntarily. <laughs> and uh, he had what most of us felt were muddy reasons at the time. He had converted to Islam. He was a Muslim minister, but most people really didn't believe him. And as was told in uh, Bob Woodward's book and Scott Armstrong about uh, the Brethren, uh, mm -hmm. when the Supreme Court justices first looked at the Ali case at that level, they turned him down summarily, and it was Justice Harlan's clerk who convinced his boss that, hey, Ali is dead serious. This guy is honest about it, and eventually it, it turned around. But he came very close to going to prison, no question about it. Of course, there are overlapping concerns here. Vietnam is one, but also emerging black consciousness is another. Yes, I would say by 68 it had emerged. It really sort of started in earnest, I think, with the sit-ins in 1959, uh, uh, North Carolina A&T, the students there at the Woolworth lunch counter, which we've seen recently uh, reenacted at the same lunch counter, and throughout the entire 60s, culminating in riots, you had the Civil Rights Legislation and the, and the Voting Rights Act in 64, 65. Uh, 68 was just, I would not want to go through a 68 again. Uh, even though it was a wonderful year for me on court, off court it was uh, my stomach was in knots the entire year. Well, obviously, you're making a contribution by your mere presence. You were breaking down barriers. You were drawing attention in a positive way. 
uh, to the struggle of black athletes in sports like tennis and golf, and right. we can get into the Shoal Creek thing uh, in a little bit. So in that sense, you're making a contribution. But there's also something that people have to keep in mind. By definition, athletes achieve their greatest prominence at a younger age than almost any other people True. who gain recognition in our society. And yet, they are often expected to have opinions on things larger than their own concerns, right. and those opinions are being formed the way any 24 or 25-year-old's opinion is being formed, and yet you only win the U.S. Open or Wimbledon maybe one time, so you better make your statement <laughs> now, and that's a, that's a strange set of contradictions. Very true. Uh, where were you <laughs> in the <laughs> early 60s? And that's exacerbated in the case of black athletes because our white athlete counterparts were not asked these same questions. Uh, in the black community, if you are well-known or if you are wealthy, you're at, no matter what your age, you're asked to pontificate about these important things, uh, partially out of default because there may not be enough people uh, of a certain statue that the public would be interested in, in, in reading about or hearing on TV or, or, or radio. But it was a very uncomfortable situation for a lot of black athletes to be in, especially in that era also when more of them started to view college as just a stepping stone on their way to the pros, in particular mm -hmm. the NBA and the NFL or the AFL. And a lot of them were just ill-prepared to answer the sort of questions put to them by political commentators, not sports reporters. Uh, some re outright rebelled. I mean, Hank Aaron, I think, rebelled. Willie Mays just rebelled. Uh, he didn't like people uh, saying that he was an Uncle Tom just because he didn't march at the head of this uh, protest march. You know, as a fellow I always felt sorry for was Joe Frazier. Joe Frazier was an obviously decent man and a very, very good athlete who deserved to be admired as an individual. But he was cast, for history's purposes, as Ali's foil. Ali's a transcendent figure. Right. He's a historically important person beyond boxing. It was Joe Frazier's misfortune to be, be cast right as the white man's favorite yeah. when he went against Ali in 1971. And Frazier was a man in a much simpler and, and less profound way than Ali, but nonetheless, he was a man of dignity and a man who should have been appreciated. And he was, in my view, mistreated in some cases by his own people. No, I agree. I completely agree. And sometimes, yes, you are cast in certain roles because uh, you are foils for someone else who is much uh, further out in front. The same could be true of George Foreman, to, to the extent. When Foreman won the heavyweight gold medal and waved that little tiny American flag, he made a lot of black Americans angry at the time. Mm -hmm. No question about it. Some black Americans might have said the same thing of you in 1968 that they said of Foreman. Maybe not as, as obviously, but in a more subtle way. If you played Davis Cup, and if not only you represented America rather than yourself in the Davis Cup, but if South Africans were allowed to play in Davis Cup competition, that this wasn't an appropriate place for you to be. What was your answer? Well, I was faced with that uh, situation at the beginning of the year, late 1967, when the draw for the Davis Cup for 1968 came out. Lo and behold, there's South Africa that the U.S. would possibly have to play in the third round. And Harry Edwards' Olympic project for human rights had already started. They had already boycotted the New York Athletic Club track meet here in New York City. And, uh, and then Dr. King was assassinated. I mean, that really put the pressure on. Uh, luckily for me, in, in reality, South Africa lost to uh, West Germany in a match played in Bandol, France, under armed guard with no spectators. So we didn't have to face South Africa. Uh, but still, I felt a lot of sympathy with what the Olympic track athletes were going through. Uh, but as the year went on, I felt more and more comfortable about uh, playing Davis Cup uh, and uh, just sort of staying current w with what was going on. Uh, I think, luckily, the U.S. Open occurred before the Mexico City Olympics, so uh, it's not as if I had to follow Tommy Smith and John Carlos and do something mm -hmm. Uh, as spectacular as, as, as they did, but I was glad when the year was over. <laughs> you had an interesting point of view about Vietnam that seems to be inconsistent with other things we know about you politically. Uh, I read where you actually felt a void in your life because you didn't go. Um, 
in this sense, one of the ways that the males of the species can express their masculinity and be adored, admired, put on a pedestal, as it were, as such for, is through athletics. Because you are demonstrating physical qualities that people associate with masculinity. You're strong, fast, uh, whatever, or combinations thereof. Another way is through wars. I mean, in fact, the two categories of, of, of endeavors, I think, that lend or, or give an opportunity for someone to be cast as hero are wartime situations, and mm -hmm. a few will come out of the Mideast crisis now, and, and athletes. Uh, he was a hero. Uh, he, was, he, he performed selflessly uh, during the Super Bowl or whatever. Um, and I think along with that, probably every man deep down inside would like to experience war, would like to uh, come through a few scrapes, maybe uh, be injured a couple of times in a couple of places, but escape and come back and live to tell about it. Let's jump to 1975. You take on Jimmy Connors in the Wimbledon final. Now, Althea Gibson had won at Wimbledon, right. black woman. 57, 58. But no black man no. had ever won at Wimbledon, and obviously not that many contestants even. Uh, Jimmy Connors is the number one ranked player in the world. The preceding year, I think he was 99 and four yes, he won in three match of, play. Three of the four Grand Slams in, this, in 74. Reigning Wimbledon champion, you're the sixth seed and here you go into the final against him. What's your strategy? Um, right after my semifinal match against Tony Roach, which I won 7-5 in the fifth, a long match, I rushed over to see Connors finishing up with Roscoe Tanner in the other semifinal. And I didn't see it all, but I got the match stats, and Roscoe had never served better in his life. He served a lot of aces, and he only got eight games in three sets. And so that night, a group of friends and I assembled at the Playboy Club in London <laughs> to talk about the strategy for two days later. And we basically came to the cold-blooded, hard-headed, realistic conclusion that if I played the, the way I normally play on grass, I would lose. So going into this, the biggest match I've ever had in my life, I would be forced to play the way I've never played before on a grass court. Uh, because the alternative was, look, he's just better than you at what you do best on grass. So you've got to change it. So uh, we came up with the strategy to try to thwart that. And in reality, once the match started, uh, Connors just did not play very well. And I'm not making excuses one way or the other, but uh, clearly, if anyone sees a, a tape of that match, Connors really beat himself. He made error after error. In fact, that the first two set scores were 6-1, 6-1 in 41 minutes. Which is almost unthinkable. Yeah. It's one thing to beat him, but to dominate him right. that way. Yeah, but I got those points from his errors, not me making winners. Well, did you set him up to make those errors, though? Oh, did yes. you throw him I off was, his stride yes, and yes. unnerve him in some I way? Was try yes. My plan was to, was to hit the ball with as little pace as possible. Uh, with a lot of underspin, which means when it hits on a grass court, it's going to skid and stay very low, hit the ball right down the middle, give him no angles to open up the court, serve him wide on both sides. He's, he's left-handed and he has a two-handed backhand to pull him way off court, uh, to pull him into the net because he didn't like to come to the net. He was, he was one of the best baseline players the sport's ever seen. And if he did come to the net, try to lob it with underspin over his two-handed backhand side. <laughs> Having said all that, execution's another, right. another uh, problem altogether, but for some reason, everything I tried just worked. 40-15. So, two championship points for Arthur Ashe. That's it, and he's done it. He really has done it. And when you won, even though by some people's standards it wouldn't have been the most emotional outburst, you oh, gave yeah, it yes. a little bit of that, which yeah. was uncharacteristic for you. Very uncharacteristic, yes. And it had nothing to do with the tempo at the time. So this is 1975. Uh, it was just a strongly felt, for me, it was personal satisf satisfaction and vindication that, hey, I mean, I knew right then and there I had tried something I had never tried before on my favorite surface and pulled it off. There was a subplot in that 75 uh, Wimbledon match 
Connors, of course, was volatile, and he himself says he needed to work up some sort of personal feeling against an opponent. He needed some kind yes. of juice going through him in order to play at his peak. In your case, it wasn't difficult no. because you had made a comment. You were a Davis Cup player. Jimmy was not playing Davis Cup then. You had made a comment that he should have played, and Jimmy at least interpreted that as... Uh, libel. As, as, as libel, <laughs> but he said, said that you had called him unpatriotic, yeah. and he, he sued you for libel, although the, the, the suit was later withdrawn, but the suit was pending at the time that you took the court that's right at Wimbledon yes it was still in, in, in adjudication process when we played our final in 75 it also was dropped right after the final uh, was finished too and what had you actually said I said that Connors was quote seemingly unpatriotic end of quote and I felt that way because all of us would play Davis Cup at the drop of a hat Connors just would not play and of course we learned later that that is just you know, Connors was just not a joiner. He never joined the ATP. He, he always went his own way. Uh, and even though I have tremendous respect, I mean, I've written and said many times that I think he's the most, uh, he's the greatest player of the open era, man or woman, no question about it. But uh, he really hurt us in, in not being part of the player effort to, to get the rules and, and, and prize money and, and the, uh, the respect we wanted from the, uh, from the International Tennis Federation. Have you reconciled with him personally since? Oh, we, uh, we don't have a, when I see him, I say hello, we shake hands. Uh, his wife and my wife have tea or, or, ha, or our kids have pizza together or whatever. No, it's not like that. It's just, but I still think that uh, Jimmy hurt us in many ways. Uh, and, and I think needlessly so. I mean, he could have maintained his independence yet have helped us. How much of your gentlemanly on-court demeanor was just the normal extension of what your personality would have been in a perfect world and how much of it was influenced by the fact that you grew up trying to weave your way through segregated country clubs trying to get opportunities and knowing I guess a rough parallel in the fashion that Branch Rickey warned Jackie right. Robinson that for a while you're gonna have to hold that temper in check and you have to be a model of decorum if this is gonna succeed well, that certainly was the case early on when my coach, Dr. Johnson, for whom I mentioned that tournament win in 1961 was very important, he would not take any of his black charges under his wing unless they agreed to, to give it the, the, the Jackie Robinson Branch Rickey agreement for, for a little while because he, he feared basically that any of the Southern junior tournament directors would kick us out at the slightest provocation. Uh, but there was something even more important that overrode all of that. Uh, the seg legal, legal segregation in Virginia or whatever. And that was that I just grew up in a, in a home environment where manners uh, were very important. Uh, my father was a policeman. He was quite authoritarian. My mother died when I was six years old. And my, I think my father was a bit overprotective. But my father was very stern taskmaster. And... And basically, even up until my, <laughs> until my late 20s and 30s, I had the feeling that if, if I got out of line, my father would kick my ass, <laughs> basically. And I, I could never do anything that would embarrass my family. I just could not do that. I would, I would feel much worse than my father would feel if I did something to embarrass uh, not only my father, but the rest of my family who, mm -hmm. who who were instrumental in, in my upbringing since my mother died. One quick story here from out of left field. Tell me about what happened in the late 70s in Nigeria. Oh, gee. 1976 in Lagos, Nigeria, the first ever professional tennis tournament in black Africa. And we're staying at the ambassador's residence, Donald Eason, and there is a coup on the Friday morning of the tournament, the Nigerian president, Murtala Muhammad, is assassinated less than a quarter of a mile from where we slept. This is about 4.30 in the morning. And since the government was sponsoring the tournament, uh, but there were some anti-American feelings, we were sort of barricaded inside the ambassador's residence for two days. To make a long story short, finally the government agrees to let us finish the tournament, then fly out. Monday afternoon, I go out to play Jeff Boroviak in the semifinal. Then I'm going to play a final later and then get out. 7-6, first set I win. Love 15, I'm serving. I'm about to throw the ball up in the air. 
And on comes, onto the court comes this Nigerian army paratrooper uh, brandishing a, an automatic weapon and screaming at us, get the hell off this court. What are you all doing playing games when we are in a state of mourning uh, for our president? And so obviously I get off the court and we hide in the locker room for a while. And there's absolute pandemonium. Every Nigerian in that stand just took off and, and ran for their lives. Uh, the Americans, Europeans, those who were white, mm -hmm. didn't feel quite compelled to get up and run as fast. But anyway, we went outside. Jeff Boroviak finally got out of the locker room, uh, ran down a one-way street the wrong way, and the Romanian ambassador picked us up, took us back to the uh, ambassador's residence. Uh, it was frightening. I mean, I'd never, he, he literally stuck the automatic weapon in my back and shoved me off the court. And obviously, I did exactly what he wanted me to do. <laughs> Arthur Ashe is the author of an exhaustively researched series of books called A Hard Road to Glory, a history of the black athlete in America. And when he comes back tomorrow night, we'll talk about that as well as some of his personal experiences as a kid. And we hope to see you then. See you later.